ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಧಿಮಂದ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮುಧಿಥೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ಮೈಕೋ ವಿ ಕೋ not to just cut right to the chase birth and death <laughs> happy wednesday uh this is really a series of what they call in uh sometimes on the playground do overs you did something wrong or made a mistake and then you get a chance to do it over it it's it's krishna's mercy actually to give us an opportunity to try again and again to refine ourselves to the point in which we can be truly happy this a happiness really comes from refinement of the the human spirit when we have the human form of life we have the apparatus through which we can refine ourselves this is mentioned in the literatures given by the the primary disciples of shri chaitanya mahaprabhu the most recent incarnation of krishna in this world which which they they write sarvopati vanir muktam tapat vena nirmalam rishikena rishikesha sevanam bhakti ruchite that when we engage our present senses in the service of krishna who is known as rishikesh rishik isha means the master of the senses then we purify our senses of what that is a desire to engage in lower energies uh, the senses when they're left to their own devices become addicted to dull matter and petty things that are inconsequential they're available to lower species of life and human beings can refine their senses including the mind and the intelligence and become attracted to a higher category of energy from of which we are a part krishna says in the bhagavad gita as we discussed last week abhumir apo analovayu kamono bhura evacha ahankara ityame binna prakritir ashtada that there are uh, lower separated energies that we're all familiar with earth water fire air ether mind intelligence and ego of course we may not be familiar with ego or have studied it as a substance or a lower energy we just know that there is something called an ego and people talk about it a lot freud was into it and there's a uh, a category of energies that are lower and then there's a category of energies that's higher how much higher much higher <laughs> it's aparayam itas twandyam prakritim vidime param it's supreme it's part we are not part of the lower energy we don't belong to earth water fire air ether different category we belong to the higher category of energy called param supreme so krishna is the origin of that energy his body is known as sakchit ananda vigraha it's a form of knowledge eternity and bliss and we have that also we're like tiny sparks from the fire that is that same quality so when we come together here for this kind of uh, satsang to be together to discuss these topics then we commune with that higher energy and as we're doing it says the verse i quoted earlier sarvopati vanir muktam we engage our senses by hearing by chanting by remembering by serving and so forth in practical ways then the senses become purified and refined and uh, when they do it's compared to putting an iron rod what is this young man's name up here back here your name with that nice shirt yeah what's your name abishek what a winning name uh, abishek if you take an iron rod and you put it in a fire hot fire and you leave it there what will ha- happen to the iron rod don't call a friend yet try first <laughs> what hey, abishek are you a ventriloquist abishek what happens to it when you leave it in there long enough hot iron rod leave it in the fire what will happen it will get hotter hotter higher the, how hot can it get what's the hottest what's the terminology for the hottest that you can imagine red hot red hot so it gets red hot and then it has the same quality as fire abishek do you agree say yes for 10 points abishek say yes 10 points for you <laughs> Okay so red hot 
it's transformed. So similarly, our senses become transformed when they're, they're connected to the supreme fire we call Krishna. He's the origin of all uh, spirit. He is the original spirit. In fact, he's everything. But his self is different from everything at the same time, simultaneously. This is called the chinta beda beda tattva. He's everything. There's nothing else but Krishna, but he also has a separate uh, existence. He mentions this in the beginning of the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. He said, see my mystic opulence. Although I'm everywhere, I'm everything, everything comes from me, still I have my independent, individual existence. That's what we're after. Because there are various features of God. Vedanti tat tatva vidas, tatvam yaj jnanam advayam, brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaniti shabdyate. This is for Srimad Bhagavatam. It mentions that the, the Supreme Personality of God, it is advaya jnan tatva, is one truth. There's nothing different from God anywhere. Nothing separate at all. But there's three features. Generally, Brahman means the effulgence of the Lord, which is all-pervading. And this is a, a, an amorphous kind of energy. And then there's Paramatma, which is the expanded version of the Lord. He goes into every atom of the universe. He enters the hearts of every living entity and so forth. And then there's Bhagavan. And Bhagavan means that original personality with who has all qualities, charming uh, attributes, and has his, his own personal uh, existence in the spiritual world. And this is uh, Krishna, Bhagavan Krishna. He has many names, but we say Krishna because it means all attractive. So by hearing about Krishna, who's the supreme fire, then we become transformed. And all these senses in our body are... Um, no longer material. They become fire-like, spiritualized. And from that position, when one's senses are purified and they become like fire, then one can understand Krishna. The Padma Purana, for instance, says, Atashi Krishna Namadi na bhaved grayamindri sevan mukhi jivado swayameva spuratyada. No one can understand God by his or her blunt material senses including the mind. You can't speculate to understand God. Otherwise, it wouldn't be God if you could figure him out like that. But he reveals himself to those who engage in his service, beginning with the tongue. So the process of chanting and speaking about Krishna, like tonight, we'll have some discussion, and uh, I'll say some things, and you'll say some things. You're using your tongue. And by that process, there's the gateway sense, like there's gateway drugs, there's gateway sense. This sense it, it, uh, is the gateway to all the other senses. If you start with this sense, says the Padma Purana, jihwa, jihwa means tongue, jihwa adao. Beginning with the tongue, you begin to practice bhakti by speaking about Krishna, asking questions about Krishna, singing Krishna's names, speaking Krishna's names, and so forth. Then all the other senses, they'll become affected by that and they'll become transcendentalized, purified. So this is, in essence, the, the system of bhakti. It's very simple, actually. But you have to go deeply within the simple process in order to have your own experience. Otherwise, you'll give up, and you'll go try something else, beat your head against the wall, and then come back and try again. So um, best to, to enter deeply within bhakti, if possible. Right? Uh, Hare Krishna. I'm really happy to be here. Um, this is two weeks in a row that I've, I've been here at the temple with Vaisheshika Prabhu and the, the Iskan Silicon Valley is like a, one of my anchors in spiritual life. It's like our, you know, our spiritual family. And um, but over the years, uh, Vaisheshika Prabhu and I have become so busy that our, our paths <laughs> don't cross. As I used to take uh, being here at the temple or being with him or being at his house for granted because it was like that. So um, I'm really enjoying being here and I'm uh, enjoying watching the uh, the family of devotees grow here. Uh, so it's a blessing. It's a blessing having yeah. you. Thank you very much, Sahib Guru. Yeah. Hare Krishna. You know, one other thing I'd just like to mention is that um, maybe because I'm getting older, 
but um, uh, so many of my God brothers and God sisters ha have died and passed away, and um, I'm, I'm just uh, grateful for uh, all the time, whatever time I have left here to, to serve. This <laughs> sounds like I'm going to die tomorrow or something like that. <laughs> but it's it's been uh, it's uh, been more and more in my mind. Not not so much that I am uh, afraid of death or anything. Uh, of course, there's always some fear there, uh, but the illusion is, is is that we have so much time, and none of us doesn't matter how old we are. Uh, really, we don't know at any moment we could pass away. I was just thinking, especially maybe because of John McCain, uh, you know, a great senator just died and passed away, and I was, and everyone's uh, eulogizing him now. And uh, but for him, it's. The dream, the dream is over, and it doesn't make any difference at all <laughs> uh, that he, that he's passed on, and uh, so I, I just want to live my life um, every moment, knowing that uh, just be just uh, being ready to pass on and and to just leave uh, leave the dream that uh, I have something to do, you know, with this world, or well, like you were saying, Vaish, that. Um, we come from a higher dimension, and we uh, we can contact that dimension any time that we uh, notice our being and uh, connect with Krishna through the sound vibration, and uh, then we're we're always in a a state ready for blast off. <laughs> I'm just rambling on here, but uh, this is uh, you coming together in these sanghas is. Uh, uh, over time, uh, it really um, helps us uh, contact and, and stay always in that uh, in the spiritual vibration, our, our true self. So it doesn't really matter um, where we are or when we go. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Tomorrow I'll be giving a, a talk at at Intel, and uh, I'm going to show you the the slides that I'm going to use at Intel, unless we adjust them. But uh, I'll uh, adapt it a little more towards the uh, process of Krishna consciousness, which is, is described. The spiritual practice is very uh, systematic in a way. In in many uh, instances, the scriptures will say things like anupashyati. You should systematically see things in a certain way. And uh, anukramishriti, this is another uh, statement that with the word anu. Anukrama means step by step, you do something systematically. And the acharyas, or the great teachers of bhakti, go out of their way to lay out a systematic path so that we can actually make progress because human life is so full of potential. We can do anything with it. We have this uh, free will. In fact, recently I was reading from Eric Fromm, who was talking about how people are afraid of free will. Because it's, it's actually a very big challenge to take responsibility for your own life. When you think about it, it's a little scary. Sometimes people even say, why did God give me free will? And to this degree, uh, Eric Fromm, sociologist, is analyzing how people in many cultures, they, they sign over their free will to other people. They'll give their free will and say, you know, I don't want to deal with it. I'll just uh, take up groupthink. And uh, I'd rather be subjugated than actually exercise my free will. Of course, we're always subjugated one way or the other because we're so tiny as uh, infinites infinitesimal living entities. However, Krishna has given us a free will. He mentions uh, various, in various ways in the Bhagavad Gita, for instance, he'll say, he says, Samoham savabhuteshu nami dveshu stinapriya ye bhajanti tumam bhaktya maite teshu chapyaham. He says, I'm equal to every living entity. However, he says, if someone approaches me uh, lovingly, then I reciprocate. He's responsive immediately responsive. And in Gita also he says, Yeyatamam prapadyante tamstataiva bhajamyaham 
Mama Vartmana Vartande Manusha Parta Sarvasha. Everyone follows my path in all respects. And he says, as they surrender to me, that is all living entities, I reward them accordingly. So there's an eternal reciprocal relationship that every one of us has with Krishna. And we've never been separated from Krishna. Even while we're in the material world, and even as I've forgotten Krishna here, Krishna's still reciprocating with me. In, in fact, <clears throat> the way the material nature is organized is mentioned in the Bhagavatam. Asao gunamayer bhavera bhuta sukshmendriya mabhi swan nirmiteshu nirvishto bhunte bhuteshu tat gunan. And in this verse, uh, Sutta Goswami is describing how at the beginning of a creation, and there are many, the, the world, material world that we are now inhabiting, spirit souls living here in this temporary world, is being created and annihilated again and again. Krishna says it in Gita, Bhutva, Bhutva, Praliyate. It's constantly being reconstituted. In fact, there are different kinds of annihilations. Some of them are periodic and some of them are constant. If you, in case you haven't noticed, everything's falling apart around you. <laughs> it's a little um, annoying, to say the least. So, uh, at the beginning of creation, after the cataclysm and the material nature is wound back up again into the body of Mahavishnu before he reconstitutes everything, uh, as he does reconstitute it, then he reminds each living entity of what their desires were. And you know what it reminds me of since I just came from Google? Any Google people here? Intel? Salesforce? eBay? Okay. <laughs> I knew it was one of them. Okay, so uh, what's that called? CNR? What do they call that when they, they're getting all that information that they can make a composite of your personality so they can sell it to other people? Do you do that at Salesforce? CRM. Yeah, because I saw the billboard. It said Salesforce is number one in CRM. You see that on the 101 freeway? CRM. What does that stand for? Customer Relationship Management. I said, what is that? And somebody was telling me, I think it was Madhav Govinda, that uh, it means, you know, all this information that, that they're collecting at every second so that they know who I am. They know who I think, how I think. And then they can sell it to other companies. It's a very valuable information. It's like, they know everything about you. So in a similar way, th that's a mimicry, actually, of the way the material nature works. The material nature is always collecting information from us at every second. You look over there, you know, it's like, oh, why'd you look over there? I think I like that. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Jayato Vishayan Pumsam, Sangas Teshu Bajayate. You like it? It's yours. <laughs> and like, well, I don't like it now. It's too bad. It's yours. <laughs> Like that you see, you broke it, you buy it. So, you know, we collect things with our consciousness wherever we go. It's like, I like that. It's like, ning, 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 ning. It, it registers in there too late. Just like you go on the internet, you do a search. They know you search there, right? They, they know you look for a backpack and everything else. So, was it hard getting over here? Yeah, it's really hard. I should have told you, go the other way. Anyway, so all this information is collected uh, and at the beginning of a new creation, it's a gentle reminder. The living entity has desire. That's the nature of the living condition. I want stuff. So then it's like, here's what you wanted. Just like you, you close down your computer. Next day you wake up, you open, where am I? What, what do I want? You open it and all the stuff comes back. You wanted a backpack, but <laughs> you wanted to go on vacation and all these kinds of things. It just remind us. So that's all there stored up in, a, in, in this spool in our subtle body, uh, constantly uh, there. So uh, we subject ourselves to the material nature constantly through this process. So through the... Uh, systematic practice of bhakti, we can actually learn uh, how to uh, reconnect our consciousness with Krishna uh, and become fully aware. Sanitya nitya sambandha prakritish cha paraivasa. We have an eternal kinship with the Lord, but that's, it's become obscured because of my distraction in every different direction. Now, Hare Krishna. And so now, uh, Anukramishruti, the, uh, this verse, this word, phrase, comes from a, a, 
a shloka from the Srimad Bhagavatam which says, Satam prasangam mamavirya sambido bhavanti krit karna rasayana kata taj joshana dashu apavarga vartmani shradaratir bhaktir anukramishriti 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 anukrama step by step you can uh, re channel your thoughts, your energies, uh, and reconnect with uh, Krishna, reconnect them with Krishna. And this is known as Krishna consciousness. And so there's a system for doing that, an actual system, and that's lucky because humans like to follow systems. We're, we're used to that, we're very logical. So the first uh, step in doing that is mentioned in the Shastra that you have to have a, a, an awakening of faith. And this is called uh, Shraddha, which means that um, by some good fortune, and it's considered to be good fortune when you develop this sentiment that I, I think I'm interested in understanding God. Uh, I want to know more about my life. And it seems much more uh, plausible to you that there is a supreme controller than not. And not only that, you sort of have like a, a hunger to understand what is that supreme. This is known as shraddha. Your, your heart starts to uh, become uh, is stirred by the topic, like what is God, how to find God. And uh, it's, it's like a hunger because when you get hungry, you know you're hungry and you just want to eat. So similarly, we have this urge to know who is the supreme. So it's described by the great teachers of bhakti that this kind of... Uh, this kind of impulse to know God, this shraddha, comes about because of uh, our previous contact, especially with, with uh, devotees, sadhus, those who are practicing Krishna consciousness. And when we come in contact with them, we get a little knowledge or, or sangha association, where we do some seva, some service for them. Then uh, we get a little bit of a um, deposit in the bank account of our heart. And that uh, deposit, when it becomes sufficient, then this shraddha awakens. And after shraddha comes the desire to associate with people who are interested in God. That sounds like better association to me than uh, hanging out with people who are not. And this is uh, called sadhu sangha. And after sadhu sangha comes bhajana kriya, which means that I'm interested in a process. Now let me get involved and see how I can step by step make progress towards the, this ultimate goal. I have a, a clear idea that also that there is a goal. Uh, this I get by associating with sadhus or people who are practicing Krishna consciousness. I'll say, no, there, there's actually a process and there's actually a goal. And from there, the scriptures describe how you begin your practice and then what happens? It gets really hard. Because as soon as you make a, d a determination that I'm going to do this, then it, with anything, at first you just think violin, I'm going to play the violin. So you, how exciting, and you want to go get a new violin, right? Do you play violin? You're smiling, I thought maybe you play. Okay, so, what? trying to learn the cello. Oh, cello. Cherry. Okay. Yeah, okay, this, this will help today. I'll, I'll tell you how you can learn to play the cello. Uh, so, uh, seriously. So, once you, when you, the, the prospect of doing something is much easier to contemplate than actually doing it. Yes? Can I get a yes on that? Yes. Thank you. It makes me feel better. For instance, I wrote a book, and uh, it was much easier, well, in one way, it was much easier thinking about writing the book than actually writing it. Because <laughs> my editor kept calling and saying, you know, how you doing? I said, great, it's almost done. <laughs> But I didn't have anything written. Uh, and finally, you know, she said, well, send me something. And I was like, well, I don't really have it. <laughs> <laughs> but when I actually started writing, I, I saw that this is hard. You actually have to go back over one sentence 50 times and fix it. And then where does that fit in and so forth. And uh, so that's what happens when you, you start a process. You, know, you think about it, it's exciting, you get together with all the people, and like, like, this is great. And then you go, okay, begin. Initiate me. You start me on the process. Make, make me like I'm going to vow to do this now. So that once you do that, 
then there's a little trouble ahead because then you go like, wow, I'm really bad at this and maybe I can't do it. And there's all kinds of doubts that come in. This is called anarta nivriti. And so this anarta is these, these uh, habit patterns that I've collected over m m many, many lifetimes. I have to contend with all that. What to speak of the complexities of my life? There's nobody born in this world that doesn't have some complexity. And as soon as you say, like, I'm going to practice this, then everyone says, oh, you can't do it, or the, your limiting beliefs hold you back, and so forth. There's uh, innumerable ways in which uh, you'll be uh, waylaid. Or someone will try to waylay you. So this is called anarta nivriti. You have to struggle with the process. And then, when you've struggled for some time, I mean, how do people get good at something? You ever met somebody who's good at something? Like? Cooking. You see somebody cook, they just cook. And um, they're so good at it. They're better than everybody else. And they just, like, how do you do that? You know, at one point, they were bad at it. And they learned. And they went through it. And some people are born good at stuff. That's because they, they practiced in their last life. That's when well, Tamal Krishnamaraj, he was uh, sitting with some devotees and one of his disciples was serving this beautiful, perfect prasadam. And they said, I, you know, I want to learn something, how to do this. And he said, it's, it's nature, it's not nurture. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, uh, that came from practice in a previous life. You know, poor Vasamskar. So after that, one gets a taste, and because you start to get good at something and, you, and you're, you're aware that you're good at it, and it feels good to do it. And devotional service is like this also. You have to follow a process step by step. You have to go through the struggle. And no struggle, no maturity. If you don't have to face responsibilities and suffer through all kinds of um, things that seem crushing, in, in fact, the crushing responsibility, and then you take a, a systematic way uh, which I'm going to describe, how to get through it, and, and you face it, and you go through it, then you actually start to get strong and see that I can do things, and you start to develop some expertise. One of you said that you've been practicing, and you're starting to feel like, good, I'm chanting, and it feels nice. So these kinds of things start to flow, and in that flow called ruchi, and then after ruchi comes asakti, which means you become really attached to the process. Like, you'd rather be doing that than anything else. And the other things that you have to do, you, uh, you have to be dragged away in order to do devotional service. Before that, we have to be dragged away from other things to do our devotional practice. Right? Three people? Okay, good. That means you're at asakti then. So then asakti, then bhava, which means that, that really emotion starts to develop in, in one's heart. And we know what that's like because we have emotion as human beings. This is one of the experiences that we have as humans. We experience deep emotion, don't we? Uh, at what, what times in our life? What kind of emotions? What? Happy? Anybody ever been really sad? Yeah? Any other emotions? Excited? <laughs> I can't hear anything, so I'm just saying stuff. Um, envy, yeah, there's all these deep emotions. We're emotional because we're sentient beings. We, we have uh, emotions. That's what sentient means. We're, we have senses. And so we can feel that in love of God that the great teachers explain that we start to develop just like the kind of emotions that we experience when we, we lose a loved one. It, it's, it's a very deepening experience, uh, grieving, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a heavy heart. There's so many of these things. Uh, if you can imagine such a thing, of, of those things being that intense, but at the, at the same time that it, it, feels, um, it feels like a, a, a grieving experience, at the same time it, it's pleasurable. As Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described these spiritual emotions, he said, imagine that somebody's uh, giving you uh, poisonous venom and at the same time pouring nectar on your head. It's almost conflicting. It, it hurts, but it hurts good. Uh, this is hard to explain, but this is called spiritual emotion, called bhava. It starts to awaken within the heart. This is our actual nature, to experience these things. And we have, it, we have knowledge of them because we're sentient beings, but they are pervertedly reflected through our experience in the material worlds. So bhava, and then comes prema, 
which is the topmost goal of practicing bhakti yoga, which means to awaken our pure love of God, where we're actually interacting with God personally. And uh, that happens even as we live in this world, and when, we, when our heart becomes transformed in bhakti. So I gave that as an example of how there's a system that we go through. Can I have the slides? Again, as a disclaimer, these are slides I'm showing tomorrow at, at um, Intel, and that um, describe a process, the five steps to achievement, through which uh, we can advance uh, in any discipline, playing cello uh, or advancing in bhakti. And these are all important steps, these five steps. Ready? Yes. Say yes. yes. Okay, so five steps. First is get a clicker that works from over here. That's the sub-step. <laughs> oh, there it is. Was that you or me? <laughs> so when you see me do this, just... <laughs> so the word rise means to move from a lower position to a higher one. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur once said... Oh, this is going to be awkward. Intrinsic in every living being is the ability to rise in course of time. Isn't that encouraging? Intrinsic. It's part of our nature to rise. It's not our nature to be overcome by lower energies, but to rise, actually. And that's why all the scriptures are coaching us on. They're saying, come on, little jiva, you can do it. Wake up, boop, 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 let's go. You know, they're saying, you know, just practice a little bit, and you're going to make it. Uh, it's, it's our nature to rise. The, the uh, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna speaks just for us. Yes, he's speaking to Arjuna, but it's meant for all of us. It's, it's actually meant to encourage us that, yes, you can, you can improve yourself. You can move from lower to higher. So then, there, how's that? A da daunting task, as, as we begin any task, although we say rise, you look up and you think, oh my goodness, how am I going to make it up that uh, far? So the first step in, in doing this is to write your goals. You have to write them down. There's a lot of evidence, and I just read a lot of it today, uh, from many different studies that say when you write your goals down, then they start to become real for you. And your mind begins to comprehend them more deeply by writing them, actually. If you write them by hand on paper, you'll see that the, the goals that were in your head, you may have some wishes. I'd like to uh, rise in this way or that way. I'd like to improve myself. That if you write them down, it's coming from the subtle level to the gross level. You're actually manifesting something. And it, it also, in a very practical way, once you write them down, you have a document that guides you in your life. Uh, for instance, the United States of America, where did this uh, whole thing come from? A document. Which one? Magna Carta. It came from the Magna Carta. Magna Carta then went came into the uh, Declaration of Independence, and then we have the Constitution. We have all these things. They're all written down. Why don't they, why don't they just, um, you know, keep in their head. Would we have the United States of America? Huh? What do you think? No, we wouldn't have a legal system. We wouldn't have anything here because it's written down. It's, it, it's a guiding document. So when you write down your goals and you make it clear, here's, here's what I intend to do. Here's what I'm aiming at. And you make it uh, clearly in writing with your own hand then you've got yourself a document that you can look at again and again. And who's to stop you from putting it someplace that you can look at it regularly? Right? I mean, even in jail, they'll let you do that. <laughs> Not that I know that much about it, but, you know, <laughs> if you have a document, you can put it up on your cell wall and just like, that's what I intend to do. And that's where it begins. You have to have a clear idea of what you're shooting for because if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. You just go any direction you want. Krishna says, Bahu Shaka Hinantascha, Buddha Yavasainam. He says that the, the intelligence of people who don't have a clear goal, Vyavasayatmika Buddha means their mind is fixed on a clear goal. And if you don't have that, then you can go every different direction. How many different directions? Like, name one. <laughs> 
and it doesn't matter east or west north or south it could be any direction because you didn't you didn't say it so you didn't write it down so anybody can choose for you also at any time it's like why don't we do this I, go, I guess so I don't want to but I guess I have to but if you have your goal you can just hold up your sheet said sorry I already got it written right here this is the direction I'm going and your mind will present you with so many options so you have to write your goal this is the first step in order to achieve any uh, advancement in, in a discipline of any kind. So write them down. Second step is you have to get yourself a house on fire desire. What kind of desire? House on fire. You have to have a house on fire desire. Not an ordinary desire, but it has to be like ready to burn the place down. You're so uh, eager to move forward on the discipline. So why do we call this a house on fire desire? Click, 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 one click. Why do you call this a house on fire desire? Because, Prabhupada used to say, uh, if you live in a neighborhood where you don't speak the language and your house starts to burn down, you'll somehow or other get the message across. And everyone knows what that feels like. The difference between maybe I'll do something and I'm thinking about doing it someday and the intense desire that I have to do it right now. And it's so urgent, it's, there's nothing else in my mind except for this. How fast do you get it done? Well, what speed, inconsequential, you'll do it because you're so desirous of doing it. And the, incidentally, or as evidence, Rupa Goswami writes, Krishna Bhakti Rasa Bhavatomati Kriyatam Yari Kritopi Labhyate Tatalalyam Apimulya Mekalam Janmakoti Sukritir Nalabhyate About Bhakti, he says, you can't get it without a house on fire desire. He said, if you're lukewarm, you can go for thousands of millions of lifetimes. Sasrakoti. Uh, if, if you try to do it by uh, paying people off or cheating or um, pretending that you're doing bhakti, any of these things, it won't get it. You actually have to have such a strong desire to have bhakti that it's, he calls it laulium. That means like greed. It's so intense, you, you're, you can't forget about it when you're sleeping. You want it so bad. And you know, you want to play the cello. It's got to be like that too. He's like, I have to play the cello. Otherwise, it's too hard. That's the hardest instrument in the world besides clarinet, maybe. Um, there, there's, uh, you know, uh, we have the ability to hone our desire also and make it red hot and make it burn. So that comes from sadhu sangha. You have to find those people who have that intense desire and listen to them. Watch how they live and then pick that up. Don't go around with, with a lukewarm desire. It's got to catch fire. It's got to be so hot it's burning down the house. That's how strong your desire has to be. And if you have that, then uh, you'll advance in your discipline, and especially in bhakti. Step number three, but before I go, what's step number one? Go right. What's step number two? Oh. That's right. And step number three, gather quality information. You have to get good information, because there's a lot of information floating around the world, and most of it's garbage. And uh, how do you know? Because it has no bearing in uh, axiomatic truth. Now, I'm talking uh, in, this, in the spiritual realm, it's very important to get accurate knowledge. In fact, uh, it's a stricture given in uh, Sanatana Goswami's teachings where he says, Avaishnava mokon girnam putam harikatam britam. Shravanam naiva kartavyam sarpochishta this he says, if you listen to people who are practicing spiritual life, even bhakti, but they've got the wrong information for you, he said, that then it's, it's like uh, taking milk after a little serpent crawled in your house, got up there somehow where that milk container is, he got in there, started drinking it all, and then he slithered away, and you came in the next day, poured yourself a glass of milk, it's got a little bit of uh, venom in it not good for you anymore. So in the same way, you have to get uh, good information from the right source in any discipline, but especially bhakti, it's the same thing. So we look at what is information. 
It comes from the Latin word informare. Everyone say informare. <laughs> informare. When I went to Italy, I was overemphasizing all these uh, syllables uh, in, fr in French and uh, Italian. And Mario save it to Prabhu goes, listen Prabhu, if you're going to talk Italian, stop overemphasizing the <laughs> syllables. Informare means into plus forma. So literally, when you trace this word out, I couldn't fit the whole uh, Oxford English Dictionary on this page. You have to have a mag magnifying gra glass to read that dictionary. But if you look it up, you'll find out what it means is that it's a magical formula. It's something that changes things into a form. That's what it means, into a form. So when you get the right information from the right source, things start to take shape in your life. And so this is one of the primary practices of bhakti, is to get the right knowledge from the right source. So the right knowledge you get from, for instance, the Bhagavad Gita. And in the Bhagavad Gita as it is, we get the uh, knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita that is aligned with the Guru Parampara. It's been passed down uh, th through generations. And when you hear that knowledge, then naturally your bhakti begins to take shape. And as a practical understanding of information, we hear about how if you want to build a skyscraper building, you have to hear about it first. Who would you hear from? Guy at the 7-Eleven who's never built one? <laughs> from somebody who's an expert. If you heard from somebody who knows how to build a skyscraper building and has drawn a schematic diagram and can explain it to you, and they start telling you how to build the building, then you'll be able to build it you can actually build a skyscraper building by hearing about it because you got information. It begins to take form because you got the, the right knowledge passed down to you. So get good information and continue to take that information into your life. And as you do, the Bhagavatam says that that information will uh, give you a standing in the spiritual world. If you don't do anything else except for you put yourself in front of good information, especially by hearing it, like our little friend at the top, what's he called? That little dog? His, master. His master's voice. This is uh, RCA Victor? Is that the company? RCA Victor, that was the, that's their logo. The, the voice of his master. So it's got a little dog. That's when the uh, phonograph machine, or whatever it's called, what was it called back then? Gramophone. gramophone. <laughs> the gramophone, which is probably c coming back now. The gramophone uh, was a little device that was revolutionary. You could hear a, a recorded message on that thing. It would come out, and the little dog, he hears the voice of his master coming out of there. And he's going, wow, that's my master. So in a similar way, when we hear the Bhagavad Gita, it's the voice of our master. And you get that information. It's coming, coming out, going into your ears, going into your heart, and it, it uh, directs you in a certain way. And your life, everything around you begins to take shape because of that information. So you have to be informed properly in order to advance in bhakti. Click. Isn't that nice? You know, you can uh, go with the Bhagavad Gita somewhere and inform yourself. Uh, take uh, the wee hours of the day. Get up at uh, 3.30 in the morning. And when you get up at 3.30 in the morning, then you get a little time for yourself because um, other people aren't stirring at that time so much. And don't look at the internet, but take good information and take a little time to absorb it. Just take it in. And remember, as you're taking it in, it's changing your life. It's changing the form of your life. And it's showing you the direction of how to move on the path of bhakti, Bhagavad Gita. Click. Number four step out of uh, five so far. This is four out of five. What are the first three? Number one? Goals. Write your goals. There's a, there's a verb in there, right? It's not just goals, but it's write them down. And the big pen company says, use a pen. <laughs> and they did a lot of research, too, to prove that it's more important that actually you get more out of it, writing a pen. I don't, you know, this big pen company, but it sounds, the, the uh, research they did sounded pretty good. 
and there's a lot of other research you know that sh shows that but write it down and uh, n number two get a house on fire desire the 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 temperature of your desire will determine how fast you move forward on the path of bhakti or in any other discipline for that matter if you have an intense enough desire you'll figure stuff out faster than other people because you really want it you know when I saw the devotees at the Los Angeles Rathiatra all of you you're down there packing books I know how long these take me a week to do what you do now and so now I go there and I, I went around last two years I, I go around and say how everyone was doing I say hurry bowl this and that no one even heard me <laughs> I was like it's like, hi, you know, it's like no response whatsoever because I noticed that the devotees there packing books had a house on fire desire to pack it. Partly is because it was a management system. They set up three tables and they're competing against each other. <laughs> and you all are highly competitive people. <laughs> highly competitive. So it says, and you packed all the books that used to take me and more, double what I used to do, in two hours, what used to take me a, a whole week. How, why? Well, there's a system, other kinds of things like that, but you had a house on fire desire. And if you chant japa like that, what's the difference between chanting japa with, like, you know, I don't even care if I get these done, or it doesn't matter, or, you know, like I'm a little bit excited, or if you have a house on fire desire. You can change your life in one japa session if you have a house on fire desire when you're chanting is a huge difference. It could take you many, many lifetimes to advance in bhakti. If you have a little bit of a desire, you'll get there. But if you have a house on fire desire, you can advance very rapidly. Number three, get quality information. Don't settle for, for uh, information that is um, contaminated. In fact, uh, you know, Prabhupada insisted on information that was pristine. He spent so much time of perfecting his books. He said, if there's one mistake, it murders the whole book. Therefore, he had an editing crew that was very carefully going through Prabhupada's manuscripts, listening to what he ha had to say, and making sure that everything came out exactly in the right way. And uh, he wanted his, his uh, staff to make sure that these things were all aligned. Nowadays, you can pick up books anywhere. You can go to Lowy Bazaar and down to, what's that guy's name? Roger B. Harley Walsh. Sorry, Roger, if you're listening. Uh, he has a shop right across from Ganga Prasad, and they're just full of books from anywhere. And anybody that m uh, makes a, a manuscript from anything, they half-baked, it could be, they don't know Sanskrit halfway, they might not even be devotees, and they might translate this or that, Purana, whatever. Uh, but uh, Rasa B. Harley Walsh, that's his name. Rasa B. Harley Walsh is so expert that he'll take that manuscript with faulty information and it'll make it look like the nicest book you ever saw in the world and you'll pay f for that book you pull out all your rupees and here's like, look what i got I said, what'd you get who knows uh who who edited it who uh, who's overseeing it and so forth the kind of information that we get uh, from in devotional service is vitally important so we we are very careful about where we take our information from. And if you regularly take in this uh, quality information, then the quality of your life will improve. Number four is you must collect mentors. Because uh, when you're trying to refine yourself in any discipline, you need to have somebody who's already done it that can guide you. Click. Here's Andre Agassi on the left. He was the top tennis player in the world for many, many years. And there's Brad Gilbert on the right, who was uh, a tennis player. He wasn't anywhere as near as good as Andre Agassi, but uh, he's older. And he also uh, knew how to coach him. And he coached him for many, many years. And I always uh, notice in the Bhagavatam how Vidura is a pure devotee in his own right. But he picked first Uddhava and then Maitreya. And Prabhupada writes in his uh, commentary to the Bhagavatam, he said, even a pure devotee like Vidura requires a mentor. And uh, Maitreya was there. He was available. He was a senior devotee. 
but his, uh, the quality of his devotion wasn't on the same level as Uddhava or even Vidura. Nonetheless, he took assistance from Maitreya because uh, Maitreya had been there recently listening to Krishna directly and he was passing on what he had learned and guiding Vidura. So we need guides. As Devamrita Swami likes to say, Gaudiya Vaishnavism is a culture of guidance. You, if you get a, a good mentor or mentors better that uh, have followed the process and they've assimilated already the knowledge, they also have a house on fire desire and they have clear goals and so forth. You can sit with these mentors and they can help guide you on your path. How many times will you go off course? In any one day or any week? A lot of times, many times, yes. Many times because this is a, a very unstable world. We're dealing with a volatile mind. There are changing circumstances in our life at every minute. Yes or yes? yes. Correct. So uh, we have to have mentorship. We have to fortify ourselves. Find yourself quality people who have already matured and who have uh, experienced a modicum of success. And if you can put yourself under their care and refer to them when, when you're starting to have problems or doubts or you need to have inspiration, they'll be there for you. You can't move forward on any path without that. In, in the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna's talking about transcendental knowledge in the fourth chapter, he says, Tadviti pranipatina pariprashnena sevaya upadakshantite jnanam jnaninas tatvadarshina. He says, in order to understand this science, you have to approach somebody who already knows it. Tatvavit. And he said, you should inquire from them very submissively and render service. So that's, there's, a, there's a way in which you can take full advantage of mentors. One is that you're very submissive. Don't go there all puffed up like I already know something. They start to tell you and then you go, yeah, yeah, I already know that. Don't do that. Go there as a beginner. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he went before his guru, he said, I am murka, I'm a fool. I don't know anything. Sanat and Rupa Goswami, when they approached Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they said, everyone says we're pundits. We don't know anything. They knew seven, eight languages. They were uh, inconceivably brilliant in all ways. Coveys. Coveys come along. An actual uh, learned uh, scholar poet comes along about every 1,000 years. Uh, Rupa Goswami, he could write poetry that works forwards and backwards. He went before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and said, I don't know anything. Please tell me who I am. That's how to approach a mentor. Don't go there and like, I know, I know, I know, I know. Uh, and don't be, uh, don't be puffed up. Be humble. Approach in a submissive way. And then also render service. And then the mentors will pour out to you what they already have, which is this realized knowledge. They've seen it before, and they can give it to you. They can hand it to you. It comes uh, out of them naturally. And so um, this is number four, to... Uh, Collect mentors. Gather your mentors. Click. Number five. Practice. Everyone say practice. practice. How much should you practice? A lot. a lot. Practice a lot. Say practice a lot. Practice. Yeah, when everybody says, how much should I practice? You say? A lot. A lot. If you want to get good at something, you have to practice? A lot. Yeah, a lot means you have to do it every day. Uh, don't skip a day. The trail goes cold. Uh, you have to start off with a, a very uh, intense desire and, and then meet out the desire by the, the steady practice. If you do even a little bit every day, stay close to your discipline in bhakti and do what you can every day. Be consistent over time. There's a magic that takes place in, in human beings. By practice then uh, you start to, to get good at it, which is a miracle. Because what you couldn't do yesterday, after a week of practice, you start to pick up on it. Hand-eye uh, coordination, uh, you start to take in knowledge. If you just try this little experiment, when you wake up in the morning, first thing you do, uh, pull out some shlokas and keep the same ones for a month. And just maybe you just have like four to five shlokas that you have 
right? So the first thing you do in the morning, before you do anything else. What's the first thing you all do in the morning? Uh, if if uh, you, you wake up, are there, there are many other things you could do, right? But if you do this, try it. Just read your five shlokas. Read them nice and slow and do them correctly. And uh, uh, every day, just do it, and then you can move on to the next thing. What will happen in 30 days if you read your five shlokas every morning, first thing when you wake up? What will happen? Yeah, you'll start, well, you'll get in the habit, that's one thing, of doing it. And what's the other thing? You'll start learning them. And it'll be just like magic, because what will happen is you'll be standing there doing something else, like... I don't know, brushing your teeth. And all of a sudden, half the shloka will come into your mind. You go like, where did that come from? It's like, oh right, I put it in there. I practiced, and there I started to, to hear the shloka in my mind. Then I, then I get a little encouraged, because I got one part of it, like one word or two words. It starts to sing song in my head. So then I go back there, and next day I do it again and again. It starts to come together. And, and then there it is, I have something. And then you say the shloka, and say, where'd you get that? How'd you do that? It's like, I just practiced. I just looked at it. So you can do that with anything. And if you do correct practice over time, then, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, he says, I can't control my mind. Number one, most frequently asked question in the whole world. Everyone says, how do you do that? I can't chant. Every time I sit down, my mind takes off on me. It's like, welcome to the club. Here's the material world. That's, that's why we're in the material world in the first place. This is it. Practice, Krishna says to Arjuna. He said, if you just practice th uh, bringing your mind back, then eventually he'll stay. And then he'll become your friend. You know, come on, come on. And he'll come back, he'll stay with you, and then you've really got something. So bhakti is a practice. You have to do it every day. And how much do you have to practice? Yeah, and if you don't want to practice a lot, then and you just practice a little bit, then your result will be just a little bit. And if you practice a lot, then your result will be a lot. <laughs> so, uh, practice. Click, click. There it is. The piano. How could you possibly coordinate both hands on a keyboard and uh, look at music? And you know, How could you put all that together? It seems impossible, does it? The... the the left hand's doing the bass, and uh, the right hand's doing the treble, and there's two lines on the music chart, and you're looking at them both at the same time. You can't do that, right? Nobody could do that. Correct? Say no, Vaisheshika. <laughs> Say no. no. Bad, wrong. So, no, that's, that's not true. A human being, even a child, even an old man, if they just decided, listen, I'm going to write down a goal. I'm going to learn to play piano. Could he do it? Yes. How? What's the first step? Write it down. Because it, it doesn't mean anything unless you write it down on paper. Once you write it down, you're going to start shaking because you're going, oh my God, I wrote it down. What if somebody sees this? Number two? Get a house on fire desire. If you really want to play the piano, then get into it. You know, burn the house down with that thing. Otherwise... Go do something else, because it's not going to work unless you have a house on fire desire. What's number three? Get what? <laughs> get proper information. Yeah, if you get the right information about what is a piano, how do you play the piano, and so forth, then that will start to take form for you. For instance, you could sit down and read a, a book about music. Could you learn music? <laughs> no. Yes, you can. You can learn anything systematically because it's just one little piece at a time and, and it'll come along for you. And number four? Get a mentor. Because, uh, you know, you'll be clunking along thinking like, hey, I'm Beethoven all of a sudden. And then, and, then, and then you'll get your mentor will come over and go, oh, I'm not Beethoven. That's Beethoven. And then you look at Beethoven playing and like, God, I wish I could be like Beethoven. And your, your desire will increase. Because you're, you're thinking like, wow, I wish I could play like that. And uh, not only that, you'll learn the style. Of, don't use that finger. Use this finger. And don't, don't stop there. Keep going on this one. You know, you know. Then they, the mentors fill in all the blanks. Yes, you get the information right from Shastra. You can read Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. But there's a thousand questions between every line. 
that you have. And you have to have them answered in order to, f to move forward on the path. So you have to have your mentor. And then uh, number five. And how much should you practice? Yeah, a real lot. You have to practice a lot, at least every day. A music teacher always tell you, if you're not willing to put in at least 15 minutes a day, don't waste my time. Unless they really need the money. I mean, you know, don't waste my time. Because, it, you know, unless you're going to put in 15 minutes a day on anything, how are you going to move forward? But just 15 minutes a day on any practice where you really put your heart into it, it's a miracle. The human brain and the, the way the, all, everything is wired through our fingers and our toes and our, uh, and, and our ears, uh, the way that the sound goes in and then registers, all these things are favorable for us to follow this practice. And if you do it for bhakti, you find out all these, how to follow these five steps in bhakti, then you'll steadily advance and you'll feel it for yourself and you'll um, have a happy life. You'll live happily ever after. And what's the next one? Here are, the, here are the five. Please read them together. Write your goals. Get a house on fire desire. Gather quality information. Collect mentors and practice a lot. Okay, next one. So questions. Question too hard. Go to the next screen. Oh, there's a question. Yes. One, two. Okay. How is um, a process where we need to be very motivated, how is that different than if we're in a mode of passion? Oh, the mode of passion is uh, characterized by being very motivated and then all of a sudden giving up. So Krishna talks about in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, mode of goodness is sustained over time. Because as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, do thou fight for the sake of fighting without considering loss or gain, victory or defeat. He tells that to Arjuna. That's in the mode of goodness. You do your duty because it's the right thing to do and you stick with it. Now, there is such a thing as spiritual ambition and spiritual desire. And the material desire means that I'm doing this for myself and I want something out of this. So, Lord Kapiladev talks about how you can do devotional service that's motivated by ignorance or passion or even goodness. And he said those uh, acts of bhakti are a little bit tainted by these uh, lower modes of material nature. But even if you have those, but you continue to practice, uh, for instance, chanting Hare Krishna and trying to advance, then gradually those influences will be reduced. And what you'll get is the, is the pure desire to do it. So in the beginning, when we're practicing bhakti, we may have some kind of motivation, but the, the uh, that is uh, material motivation. But Srimad Bhagavatam says, or rather Shukadeva Goswami says, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, akama sarva kama va moksha kama udharati tivrena bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param. And that is, uh, whether you uh, want to have, um, whether you have no desire when you're practicing bhakti, uh, you have sarva karma, you, karma, you have all material desires, or you desire liberation, uh, you keep practicing bhakti. Go to Krishna for those things, continue, because he'll purify the desire so you can, you can get there. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the nice question. I was thinking about the mentor. So um, when we think about a mentor, usually those people who are doing the mentorship are probably, we're looking for somebody more advanced. So in the process of finding somebody advanced, we might also, often at least in our mind, thinking that, oh, this person is just totally new. I'm not too sure if this person is going to help me, you know, or if even if that person is trying to tell me something. 
So how do we keep away when, you know, even in uh, Nectar of Instruction where he says that we have to, we should know who is the Kanishta Adhikari, Madhyama Adhikari, Uttama Adhikari, understand that and go along. But how do we keep that mood right where we don't, um, you know, we don't think I am better than someone? Well, you have to be humble and feel that everyone's better than me. And then you can learn from everybody makes it easier. And everybody has something to teach. We know when we go out, for instance, to teach Krishna consciousness to others, we often learn things from them that uh, are coming from Krishna. They're, they're, they offer us some special incentive or knowledge or even chastisement that uh, for a person who is submissive, they can take that from the environment, from anywhere. The etiquette can be there always, but still, even as Prabhupada was appreciating his disciples, he said, you know, you've been sent by my Guru Maharaj. You're my gurus. In fact, someone once said he was, uh, back in the 60s, there was a, a poet, a beat poet called uh, Allen Ginsberg. Anybody heard of him? Because you've read the <laughs> Lee Lamry <laughs> But back then he was a big, he was a big deal. He was a, a, an icon in the counterculture. And so he's really famous, like any famous person nowadays. Who's famous nowadays? Anybody? Huh? <laughs> Donald Trump. There's an I-N in front of that. Um, anyone else? Or is he the only famous person nowadays? What? Taylor Swift. Okay, so say Taylor Swift. Um, famous. And so some, somebody asked Prabhupada, uh, we heard, uh, it, and he said, is Alan, you're the guru of Allen Ginsberg. And Prabhupada said, I'm no one's guru. Everyone's my guru. So, you know, he took this humble attitude. You, you have a right to do that because of the instruction of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He said, Trinata pisuni chena, toror apisuhishuna, amanina manadena, kirtaniya sadahari. Remain as humble as the grass. Be as tolerant as the tree. Be ready to offer all respects to others. Don't expect any respect in return. If you live by those four principles, you can perfect your life. And you can get so much knowledge because you're taking all the time. You can learn from everything. Even the grass is speaking to you and saying, you know, like, be like me. That's how, the, when the intelligence is purified by this quality of humility, then you can, you can take, your gurus are everywhere, your whole environment becomes your teacher. So remain humble and uh, be tolerant and give respect to others. You never know who people are. You don't know, we don't know. Living entities all have a long history. Besides, they're all part of Krishna, so they're, they're great. And of course, there's this gradation for, for etiquette where we recognize different levels of achievement for devotees. But underlying all that, we also have this sense that uh, these are living entities. And there's a stricture that you can take gold even from a dirty place. You know, this, this is a, a wise person is always looking, what's, what's the sar, what's the cream, what can, what's the essence I can take from that? But humble people learn so much more. Yes, Prabhu. Thank you for the class, Maharaj. So the question that I had in my mind was in the five steps, what about, uh, we spoke about mentors getting right information. What about having peers who are trying to do something similar? Isn't that a big part of working with peers? Successful? Yeah. And peers can, uh, you can always change some, a peer into a mentor if you want. And it doesn't have to be a big official thing, but it's just a matter of if you're open to learning from others. Even somebody who's not a peer, even somebody who's a junior, if they have some skill or knowledge or something they can teach you, there's an art to how to approach them properly and, and learn that from them. And it's always an edifying experience. Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, one more click on there. Click, click. F reflections. Easier than questions. 
Anything you heard that's stuck in your mind? You can also ask a question if you want to. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Earlier in the talk you mentioned a phrase that I liked, um, no struggle, no maturity. Yeah. Yeah, uh, someone the other day we were talking to, I forget where we were, we were in Toronto, and somebody said, this, um, it's taking so much time and I'm under so much pressure, and I said, I just read about that, it's how diamonds are made. In a geological magazine, it says diamonds come over time and in intense pressure over time. Then something beautiful gets uh, created by nature. Billions of tons of pressure under the earth. And millions of years. And then you get this incomparably beautiful gem. So similarly, of course, we're not recommending that everyone be stressed out with high levels of cortisol in their bloodstream all the time. But the fact is that if, if you, if you uh, take responsibility at, for your advancement and it's troublesome and you calculate the fact that the world's going to be troublesome no matter what you do, but if you take responsibility for taking that trouble for the sake of Krishna instead, then it changes you into something which is extremely valuable. So, uh, yes. This uh, people become mature over time because they've they've uh, taken responsibility for their own uh, spiritual practice, and also they've taken responsibilities, for instance, in our Krishna consciousness movement to help spread the Krishna consciousness movement. You have to consider a lot of things and go through uh, various uh, troubles in order to help spread the movement. Yes or yes. Yes, so many of you are, you know, you're giving an incredible amount of energy to this. As you work very hard, you have family responsibilities, which are incredible, because you have such tight and big families, uh, you know, like all over the world and stuff. And then at the same time, you take up these amazing services that you do. I mean, it, it's practically unheard of what you're doing at this time in history right now to spread the Christian conscious movement. History will show that will remember all of you for doing this. And in the process, as we're doing this all together, we've been through so much here at ISV. I mean, people look and they say, oh, nice little community. We like it here and stuff like that. But you don't know what we've been through. So many things. And we de we've done it together. We stuck together. And we just kept doing our, our just services, no matter what happens. We keep showing up for the Wednesday class. We keep showing up for our services. Whatever it is, we don't quit. We keep chanting our rounds. We take responsibility for the fact that you can't quit. You have to keep doing this. And anybody, even a person with, who can, you know, might say, that's an insignificant person, if they stick to this process, no matter what happens, even at you know, the threat of their lives, they'll keep doing it. They get recognized. They become like gems. Like Juva Maharaj, you know, why is Juva Maharaj so famous? He just uh, stuck it out. Even the circumstances were a little sideways. He had the wrong motivation to start with, but he just kept going. And there's nobody as famous as him, and now he's eternally recognized. So that's what happens in bhakti. When you stick it out, you take responsibility for your uh, devotional service then Krishna will turn you into something that is eternally uh, celebrated. Yes. So Maharaj, I was just thinking about the importance of uh, mentors. Yes. Because uh, you had mentioned in the beginning that we actually belong to the other world, the spiritual, but then we have this connection with, with the material world. Yes. And so if that is the case with us, then... Um, the, our goal could be wrong, and then our house and fire desire could be wrong. We could be gathering the wrong information until we get a mentor who's going to tell us that, you know, how, how you should tweak your goals, how you should, from where to get the right information, and so on. And then even when it comes to practice, I remember you, you used to mention about your Mridangam teacher, who used to say, don't play it fast. You know? Yes. So the mentor will also tell you that. So kind of mentor interfaces the other four. Yes, yeah, so there's a, something about the ego, false ego, that says I'm doing everything right. 
And if someone says, you know, you're doing that wrong, and you're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I do everything right. You know, you have to have some mentor there that goes, that was wrong, that was wrong, that was wrong. You know, it's really healthy to have somebody in a protected, in the right environment. That's what a mentor is. You agree. It's like, you correct me, I listen. Okay? That's it. So if you have that in your life, that you open your false ego up for a few minutes and let somebody uh, correct you, then, then you, you can actually improve yourself. You can achieve something wonderful. So it's a really important point. And, you know, it's the one Krishna makes right off. You have to have guidance in order to advance. If Vidura is a peer devotee, he's, he is a peer devotee, and, and if he has to have mentorship in order to refine himself, then everybody does. And Krishna sets the example. Lord Chaitanya, becomes, he's an incarnate, he is Krishna, but he takes a guru, and he's very submissive and loving to his guru. Even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was Nimai Pandit, it was before he had officially taken his guru, Srila Ishvarapuri. So they met, and there was this very loving relationship. Uh, Ishvarapuri was like a parent to this young Nimai, and Nimai uh, held him in great esteem. And Srila Ishvarapuri had written this book that included uh, Sanskrit grammar. And so Nimai Pandit was famous as. Uh, Sanskrit grammarian and many other things. So his guru said, you know, please, you look at this, examine my book and see if there's any, any improvements, any mistakes here that need to be changed. So Nimai Pandit said, oh, you're a pure devotee. How could there be any mistakes? But then he looked at the book and he came back next day and he said, there's one little thing. He said this verse, Atmanipodi, it should have been different. And that's all. And then his guru took the book home. He looked at it. He looked at the scriptures, came back, said, actually, it was correct. This stays the way it is. It's, it's really like this. And Nimai Pandit, according to Vrindavan Das Thakur, the author of Chaitanya Bhagavad, was unlimitedly happy that he was corrected by his future guru. And when he met his guru there in Gaya, he surrendered to Sushil Ishvara Puri. He said, I'm murka. I'm a fool. I don't know anything. And he held with such great reverence his, his uh, mentor, guru. So this relationship is very powerful. One has to have this kind of guidance in one's life. So you have to be submissive to guru and not disobey the orders of the spiritual master. Consider the spiritual master an ordinary person. Or, and your mentors, you have to be open. Reflections. Yes, Hansapriya. What happened to our band? Oh, okay. In House of Fire, uh, House, House on of Fire Desire. Desires, you mentioned if you take lightly, then you're going to get outcome also lightly. Yes. And also I was thinking, when you showed the last slide with all the five steps, and I was thinking how nicely it's interlocked and interconnected. Yeah. And it gave me immediately the reflection of the redwood trees, that how the roots are interlocked, and in order, they're so strong, and that's how they can get taller and taller. And I was thinking, in order to get stronger and taller, you have to be really locked into this five steps. Thank you. Uh, Very nice analogy. And, and also so true about the quality of our desire. If it's red hot, if it's burning hot, if you can burn down the house with your desire. <laughs> if you have to know, it's a lot different than like, oh, whatever. Uh, meh. I, can't, I, can, I can do it or not do it. And then why, why would you advance very quickly? So make your desire hot. So we have a couple more. One's from the internet. Right, Shraddha? Okay. This is from Nami Sharanya Prabhu from Texas. Nami Sharanya. Dhanva Pranams Guru Maharaj, Guru Dev, thank you for your amazing class. The question is, how do we always keep the house and fire desire and never forget it? Well, it may not be possible to keep your desire at that temperature. <laughs> but you have to keep it in mind that that's what drives you. Now, in the old days, nobody here is, you can respond to this because you're not all from the old days. But from the old days, people didn't have gas or electric heating in their houses. They had stoves. 
And they had to keep it burning because they didn't have matches either. It was hard to light a fire back then. You didn't just strike a match and light some paper or something like that, or throw in lighter fluid. They had to start the whole thing, get the fire going, or if they were really good, they could do mantra. But this uh, fire was a rare thing. So you keep it burning all the time in the winter, in the stove, in your house. And if it went out, you had to go to a neighbor and say, listen, I need a little fire. You get a little coal and you bring it back, you know, across the, the wintry street and you put it in there and then you start things again. So the same way, we have to know what house on fire desire means and come back to it. And when, when the fire starts to go down, then we have to go get some fire. But you have to know that that's what drives everything. If you have that desire, then you'll figure things out. And if it starts to wane, which it will, because the influences of the material nature are so penetrating and so um, onerous. One other word I was thinking of. Um, it'll come back later. But in any case, you have to be sure that, that it'll go out and you have to keep it coming back. And especially for, through sangha, through good association. If you keep association regularly with people that already have that desire, then it'll keep you burning as bright as you possibly can. So th this is intelligence, to put yourself in good association as much as possible. And if you're just there, then you'll pick up on it because we're highly impressionable. Was there one more? Yes. Thank you, Naima Sharni Prabhu, for tuning in. It's so nice to hear from you. This one more for Vaikunth Naik Das from India. Vaikunth Naik. The heavy hitters are <laughs> signing in tonight. My key takeaways. Number one, if you do not know where you're going, any road will take you there. Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> That's where it's from. If you don't, he asked the, what is it? He asked the rabbit, and he's like, where are you going? He's like, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Yes. And the second is the temperature of the desire will determine how fast you get there. Yes. Get a red hot desire, and so quickly you can advance in devotional service just by having that intense desire. Yeah. The last one? I had a question based on the uh, initially you were mentioning about how the material nature. It deposits all our samskaras and like everything gets impression. So I was thinking that we have impressions from so many lifetimes and so many unwanted samskaras are there. So it's kind of kind of discouraging to know that anything can pop up any time and it can be detrimental to our spiritual life. So how do we? Well, it's just like you know, you get a um, if your if, you, if your computer gets a virus, you get you got to get antivirus program and run it. They have powerful antivirus. It's going, oh, I got a virus. My thing's running. You put in the little, there's no more disks. You, you uh, run down the program. <laughs> and, you run, and you run it. And it starts going through your whole hard drive, figuring out where all these little guys are, you know, and lining them up. And then it comes back with these little rows and says, okay, it's in sector four down here. And there's another one down here in sector 15. And uh, picks them all out. And then it says, you know, would you like me to, like, correct it again. It's like, yeah, correct it. You know, and it runs it through and runs it through. So we have to constantly be running this antivirus, uh, these antivirus programs. So the best of all of them is the uh, Hare Krishna mantra. You run that every day because they're all like, ding, bong, bong, bong. you wake up in the morning, it's like, oh no, I got a virus. You know, and it's like, okay, run the program. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. How long do I have to run this for? 16 rounds. Don't stop. Hare Ram, Hare Ram. You know, and you run, <laughs> you run the antivirus uh, program. And then at the end of 16 rounds, you go, I think I'm okay. I can go outside now. <laughs> you can go to work now, sir. Uh, I think you're going to be okay. So, and then also there's experts. They go through and they, they look and they see, you know, how to erase your past and all that kind of stuff past history, there's all kinds of things. But the real thing is the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. The, the, um, the, the Shastras all say that, you know, temporary measures, uh, you can adjust this or you can adjust that. But unless you deeply cleanse your heart of, of the desire, there's, see there's a desire seed in the, in the heart of the conditioned soul to enjoy the material world. That has to be flooded with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy, and then it won't grow anymore. It, it kills the seed. 
And when you, when you lose that desire to enjoy the material world, you're a free being to uh, engage in devotional service. Nothing's holding you back. What holds me back is my motive. I still have an inner motive that I want to enjoy the material world. And that's what makes me so sad. I can't break away from that. But in the seventh chapter of the Adi Lila, uh, uh, the author, Krishnas Kaviraj Goswami, talks about when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Panchatattva came to this world, they brought the flood of love of Godhead. They broke open the storehouse that Krishna had brought, but he kept it locked up a little bit because he said, you know, you got to, only people who surrender can open this. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu brought it and said, everybody gets it. Just bring it out and flood the whole world with it. You know, we see these festivals. People walk into a Hare Krishna festival, which is really Lord Chaitanya's manifestation of mercy in public. You know, it's like, what's going on? Who cares? Get in there and dance. You know, and they're like, ah, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. What is this? I don't know. Just keep doing it. And, and you know, they get overwhelmed. And gradually they get pulled in because they go like prashadam, devotees, the holy name, the Bhagavad Gita. And, they, and that desire seed gets drowned by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy. And they're able to overcome uh, these pasanartas. However, you know, once, once, you know, as I mentioned, you get involved, you get interested, then anarta nivriti, the struggle comes, and you have to be, you have to be very meticulous to overcome anarta nivriti. So many people come to disciplines. How many people do you think have tried to play the cello in this world? Approximately, give a number. Two million three hundred and and fifty. And how many of them, as a percentage, have kept doing it? That's pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> that means twenty-eight percent of two million three hundred and thirty. Somebody figured out there'd be that many cello players on the planet. It's a hard instrument. Not that many people continue in any discipline. So you have to find out the ways and means to keep going. And in the practice of devotional service, people come and they say, oh, great, I'd like to do this. And then they change their mind later because uh, it's much easier to, to not. I mean, it's not easier to not do it. It's actually much harder. Uh, but the conditioned mind and so forth may pull us down into this. And now we're going to have a little kirtan. Because, yes? Oh. Announcements, yes. I would like to say that we have an opportunity here at ISV uh, that is unprecedented. Just as when Krishna, his, perhaps his greatest pastime, according to the Acharyas, is lifting Govardhan Hill. And here's the logic behind it. When he lifts Govardhan Hill, then all the devotees get to spend time with him for the whole time that he's holding the hill up. Normally, uh, Mother Yashoda sees Krishna, you know, when he comes home in the evening, takes his bath, she feeds him, puts him to bed. And in the morning, you know, she's thinking he's going to leave pretty soon to go tend the cows. And so, you know, it makes her sad. And she follows him all the way to the pasture and keeps asking him, did you bring your lunch? Did you bring your lunch? Are you going to, you're not going to get stuck in the sticker bushes? She's worried, but then she doesn't see him all day long. And the the rest of the devotees, they see him at a certain time. The gopis see him at night when he sneaks back out of the window. And Yashoda thinks he's sleeping. So at Govardhan, he's holding the hill, and everybody sees him for 24 hours, seven days. And it's the happiest time of their lives because they're with Krishna and they don't have to take their eyes off him even for a second as he's, he's just standing there holding the hill. So in the same way, when we have Janmashtami and Vyasa Puja, you know, we all love each other here at ISV, right? Yes. Say yes. yes. And we all like to do service together, right? Yes. Yes. But, you know, somebody's doing service over here, making garlands, somebody's in the kitchen. I didn't even know until Levantika tells us who's in there. And, uh, but Jan, during Janmashtami, we're all together, uh, all at the same time serving. It. Everybody gets to see the, the level of, of desire that the other devotees have. And when we see the devotees parking cars all night and they're in ecstasy, and we feel like, oh, I wish I could be more like them. And we, we want to, uh, we see devotees that are in there cleaning the, the restroom so that we become known as the cleanest place on earth. And then uh, they become happy. And when people see that we're cooperating and everyone's doing their job and doing the needful, no matter what, then they become 
impressed that this is actually a spiritual organization, that these people are all here out of happiness to serve the people who are coming here. So it really matters more at Janmashtami and Vyasa Puja uh, what we do and how we do it more than any other time in, in the service that we do. Because this is Krishna's birthday, this is our final exam that we're all taking together. How do we all pull together to have a festival in this tiny little uh, temple for 10 to 12,000 people? Uh, by you know, planning over many, many months, putting together all kinds of systems. But the most important thing is our mood of cooperation that we all work together. And I really like what Naveen and Nirada Prabhu said the other day during Balaram Purmanina. I mean, yes, I did listen to his lecture. Um, <laughs> He, he said that Balaram uh, engages in all the different relationships with Krishna. And he named how he did. I won't go into details. But he said in a similar way, we should also feel like we should extend ourselves in whatever way is necessary in order to help. So th this is the most vital time for us to be together and for us to serve together. And um, my personal plea is to a step up for the services that nobody else wants to do. That's how to really um, advance during uh, Janmashtami. And do your service. Don't matter. Don't care who's watching. Just do it for Krishna. Remember that it's his day and he's, <laughs> he's watching you <laughs> as you do your service. These, these are the most... Uh, anyway, this is my, my plea uh, that we step up during the Janmashtami time and do the needful in, in whatever way possible and to make an impression on ourselves, on the rest of the congregation, and, and on everybody who comes here for a, a John Mashtami. There are the specific things I should say also, right? Saturday, yeah. So, um, yes. Pretty good. I think I covered a lot of this. Uh, we've been talking about this a lot because um, this is uh, the mood of the festival is is more important than than actually getting it done. So this is uh, we've all been together for many many years, and I think back to the times on Bascom, even before Bascom, even like uh, on. New Jersey Avenue. We just had a little house. The deities were in the living room. And then we had a storefront. We had to go to the karate studio next door. And then on Latham Street, we had to put tarps in the parking lot. And then, uh, uh, and then we went to uh, Bascom. And then we went to um, the uh, fencing studio across the street. That was brilliant. Uh, and somehow or other, we all pulled together. But no matter where we were, whether it was a stinky karate studio, uh, didn't matter how much incense you burn in there. Um, you know, we, we were happy because we were all working together in the mood of... So from my heart, I'm, uh, you know, please, uh, let's, let's keep that mood because that's what pleases Krishna. And any facility he gives us comes from that mood of cooperation together. What do you think? Yes. If you agree, say Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna! Okay. So um, now we're going to have an Artik ceremony, which uh, you can't beat that anywhere on the planet. There's nothing like an Artik ceremony. Video games, uh, people play, they look at movies, all stupid. But Artik ceremonies are the most sublime, beautiful thing. The worship of the form, which is not different, of the Supreme Personality of God. With all these things, like fire and water and a yak fan and everything like that. So this is beautiful. And we're going to sing and dance for the Lord. Nobody else gets to do that but us tonight, right here at Iskand Silicon Valley. So we'll put all the asans away, and we'll stand up, and we'll dance to our hearts content for the Supreme Personality of God. Gaur Premanande Haribo. Vanchakopa the Rusha, Kripas in the Bay, which are Patitan and Pavani, Bio, Vaishnavi, Bio, the Monomahan, and the Koti Vaishnavi Gija. His grace, Vaishishiko Prabhuki.
शिल प्रोपात की